Years ago, when I lived in Missouri, I decided that I was going to take some grad school classes at this small Bible college in town. And so my undergrad was in uh, film production. And so what I did is I actually traded film, like uh, video work, for classes. It was kind of a, kind of a cool deal. And uh, one of the classes that I decided to take um, was uh, this class where we met once at the beginning and then nothing, just all in line. We're working on one or two projects and then we meet once at the end to turn in everything and then we're done. And so I, I went to this first part of the class. I'm like, yeah, seems like a great thing. There's like a thousand books to read and uh, we're probably going to be fine. And then like a week after, you know, and there wasn't going to be a lot of like checking in and deadline. I need all the extra help I can get. I don't know about you. Um, I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to actually do this class. I'm going to drop this class. And so I decided I dropped the class or so I thought. And um, have you guys ever done that where you think you did something really important and then it turns out later that you didn't? Um, I, so I'm just like happy go lucky guy not going to grad school for a semester. And then I get a notification. It's like, hey, your final's due in like a week. And I'm like, that's when I had like the, oh my God goodness, what am I going to do? And so what I decided to do is I decided that I was going to, even though I had not participated in any of the class, I was going to do the final. And I was like, you know what? There's not a lot, I, like, it's not a lot of uh, 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 assignments. I think I could probably manage. Like if I do okay on the final, I should be able to pass the class. And so I go in, I try hard. I am writing up a storm. I'm doing all the things that I think I need to be doing. I put together a, I birth a paper that I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but here is my, uh, my solution to it. And I turn it in. And a couple of weeks later, I get my grade back. And wouldn't you know it, I don't pass the class. Because <laughs> it turns out, if you try really, 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 really hard, but you don't do what the professor's telling you to do, you fail. Uh, and that just seems unfair. Uh, but... <laughs> It's really not that bad. Um, you know, I, I, I did a lot, but I, I just missed the mark. Tonight, we are in week two of a series where we're looking at encounters that people had with Jesus and what we can learn from this encounter. Last week, we looked at this woman at the well who encountered Jesus. And today, we're going to look at this one man's late night encounter with God and what we can learn from this and what we learn and what we need to know about this person that we're going to talk about today is that this person did all of the things. He tried really hard. This guy, if you were to, if, if you were to ask people around this guy, they would be like, this guy is like, this guy's doing good spiritually. He's doing good religiously. Like he's got things going on. Like he, he's, he's doing really well. People would have looked at him and thought, this guy is in. This guy's in the kingdom of God. This guy's going to heaven. This guy, this guy is doing all right. If anyone is going to make it, that guy is going to make it. He definitely has right standing with God. But in this conversation, this person, as he's talking with Jesus, Jesus is going to tell him, you're doing a lot, but you're missing the mark. You're missing it. And Jesus is going to tell this man, ask this man a question today that I believe he is asking every single one of us in this room today. The question that he is going to ask is the most important question that you and I can answer. And, and here's the deal. If you want the things that God offers, you have to do it the way God wants you to do it. You can't circumnavigate what God offers and what Jesus offers to do your own way. In order to get what God has, you have to go his way. And the man, what he was asked by Jesus is, is this question. And this is like the main point of the, the message. And this is the question that I want you all to be asking yourselves throughout this entire message. And even as we leave the question is, are you born again? Are you born again? In John chapter three, if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter three. We're going to start out in verse one. And this is where Jesus, he, he started his ministry. 
He's doing some things. He's seeing some miracles happen. You, you know, he's, he's, he's causing some, some cool things at a party. A uh, lot, lot of, he's, he's, you know, telling people to get out of the temple. They're doing some wrong stuff. And in John chapter three, we meet a man named Nicodemus. And this is what it says. John chapter three, verse one. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to see Jesus at night. You see, what you need to know about this man, Nicodemus, is that he's a Pharisee. And a Pharisee was a group of religious leaders in Jesus' day who did not like Jesus. Like if you were called, like if, if you've been around church very much and someone calls you a Pharisee, that's not like a good thing to be called. Um, you know, but back then, like that would be like, oh, you're doing good. Like you're, you're kind of the person who's got it together more so than any other person. And the, these Pharisees, they did not like Jesus to the point where they were part of the group that wanted to kill Jesus and eventually succeeded in killing Jesus. Some people, by the way, a lot of people love to say that, oh, it's the Romans who killed Jesus. No, 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 no. The Jewish leaders killed Jesus through the Romans. Um, but they just hated Jesus. They did not like Jesus. So every time you think of a Pharisee, think of someone who hates this new person of Jesus and think of someone who religiously followed every single commandment in the Torah, every single uh, law that they could. The, the Pharisees were so religious that they actually developed laws outside of the biblical laws so that they wouldn't break any of the other laws. So they started to develop even, like they would make the law more expanded and more expanded. This is how religious these people were. These people memorized the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Like they, they were spiritual giants in that day. But then there's this one leader, Nicodemus, who is a part of a group of people who hates Jesus. But he decides, he's like, no, there's something different about this guy. And so what he did is that he goes to meet with Jesus at night. You know, some scholars believe that he came to meet with Jesus at night because he didn't want other people to see that he was talking with the very person that his group of people hated. What was so important that Nicodemus wanted to talk to Jesus with? This is what it says. And he came to him and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You see, already Nicodemus is so different than all these other religious leaders of the day because he looks at Jesus, who's like a revolutionary, according to them. And he doesn't address them. He doesn't address him sarcastically. He looks at him with reverence and respect. And he says, rabbi or teacher. And he knows that based on what he has seen, the evidence that Jesus has put forth, the miracles that he has done, that he is not just this ordinary teacher. That he actually might be a representative of God. And he's not calling Jesus God. He's saying, listen, you're, you have a lot of interesting things. You probably, God is probably with you in the same way that God was with Moses or Elijah before. You, you, there's something different about you. And he doesn't really, you notice how he doesn't really ask Jesus a question. He just says, hey, teacher, seems like you got a lot of cool things going on. Like you must be from God, you know? But Jesus, who is so good at this, Jesus like, looked past the statement that he said, and he went straight to the point of why Nicodemus was here. And Jesus, hearing the statement, he gets straight to the matter. And so he says in verse three, Jesus answered him and said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, um, how can a man be born when he is old? Uh, can he enter into a second time his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, gross. No, he didn't say that. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. 
The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes or where it goes. So is it with everyone born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? I don't understand. And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And let you, and yet you don't understand these things? Surely, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you, you do not receive our testimony. You don't believe in what we're doing. I have told you earthly things and you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? The one who has ascended into heaven, or who is, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And Jesus, what he's doing is he's telling this man, that you are so close to the kingdom of God, yet you are so far away. This is a man who keeps the law religiously. This is a man who has added extra laws, been a part of people who added extra laws to make sure they don't mess up. He is religious. He is spiritual. But Jesus says that you missed it. You missed it. Because here's the deal. The critique that Jesus had for the Pharisees was that they would do everything to have this outer appearance of doing good. They would follow all the laws, keep all the commandments, but inside they were empty. He called them whitewashed tombs, like really beautiful looking tombs, no substance on the inside. And Jesus, what he's saying is that, listen, it's not about doing the things. You are a religious leader but you have not been born again. The only way to enter into the kingdom is to be born again. So the first point I have for you today, and the, the, one of the warnings that we have to recognize for ourselves is this. You can be a moral, religious, and active person in the church, but completely miss the kingdom of God. Jesus said that the only way that you get into the kingdom of God is to be born again. And this, this word born again, another way to say it's born from above. And Nicodemus, like the woman at the well last week, he gets really literal with what Jesus is saying. He's like, now do I, do I, do I have to go back into my mom's like womb? That's weird. And that's something you don't want to think about very long, but um, Jesus, he, he explains exactly what is needed in order for someone to be born again. And what he does, is he says, you, you got to be, be born of water and the spirit. Like, what does that mean? What Jesus is doing is that he's borrowing language from the Old Testament, from the prophet Ezekiel. And the prophet Ezekiel, one of his big things that he told the people of Israel was that your hearts are prone to wander. Your hearts are hearts of stone. The thing that you need and what is going to come one day is that there's going to be one person that is going to break your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And one of the images that Ezekiel used to describe this process is you are going to be sprinkled with water and you are going to be cleansed from your imperfection, that how you run to idols and how you run to sin. You need to be cleansed from that and you need to be cleansed from, from all this stuff and you need to be transformed and given a new heart with a new spirit. And Jesus, when he's talking to this religious leader who knew the prophet Ezekiel, but who was missing it, Jesus said, you need to be born of water and of spirit. This is what he was referring to. And he says, listen, you're the teacher of the law. Like, you, aren't you a teacher of Israel, but you don't remember what all of the Old Testament is pointing to? what everything is leaning towards. And the reality was the the reason he wasn't able to understand this and see this is because Nicodemus himself, he had a heart of stone. He wasn't a part of the kingdom of God. He He was not born again into the kingdom of God. And so he didn't have the ability to really see what Jesus was doing. 
And so he, Jesus, he, he calls them out and he tells them what he should have been leaning towards. And he can, goes on and he, and he says he, this interesting story from the Old Testament, another story from the Old Testament. In verse 14, he talks about Moses. And he says this in verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up. And whoever believes in him will have eternal life. What Jesus is referring to right here is a, is a story from when the people of Israel, when they were led by Moses, they were, they, they were saved and miraculously led out of Egypt. They were given the law. They were established as a new people group, a new kingdom, a new nation. And they're on the way to the promised land, but they had, a, you know, they were, they were sinning and they were, they were just not a group of people that God wanted to have in the promised land yet. A lot of the, uh, a lot of preachers say they, they were out of, it took them just a little bit to get out of Egypt, but it took them years to get Egypt out of them. And so one of the things that happened in the book of Numbers was that the people of Israel were in the wilderness and they started complaining. They started groaning. They started moaning about uh, the fact that they were, you know, just irritated with their, with their circumstance. And so they complained against God and complained against Moses. And finally, a judgment for the rebellion came up and their lack of faith to believe that God was going to do something amazing. And the fact that they forgot about how God was doing something amazing just recently what the Lord did is the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the Israelites and many people were bitten by these snakes and many people died. And so the people of Israel during this whole thing, they cried out to Moses and they cried out to God and said, we're so sorry. We realize how dumb we were. We, we have forsaken you. We have lost faith in you. Can, we want to repent for this. And so God told Moses, Moses, what you need to do is you need to take a snake and you need to put it on a pole and you need to put it up in the air. And everyone that looks up at this snake, even if they're bit, they will be saved. They will be rescued. They will be okay. And so everyone who did, everyone who was bit, who looked up at this serpent that was elevated and, and ascended, they were okay. They were saved. And what is happening here is that Jesus, he's using an Old Testament story that's really an analogy of pointing ahead to what he is about to do. And he's saying that the way that you are going to be able to be born again is just like what Moses, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him will have eternal life. You see, Jesus, he was a person who was put on a piece of wood and he was lifted up. And now for anybody who desires it, everybody who wants it, we can look at Jesus on the cross, not physically now, but in our hearts when we read the story and the Holy Spirit comes and reminds us of what's going on, we can look at Jesus and we can believe that he is God and we can be saved. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, the way that you can become born again, is not by doing a lot of stuff, but by looking at me looking at me, looking at what I can do, what I'm going to do for you in the whole world. It was a picture of the future cru crucifixion and the exaltation of what Jesus was going to do. It's one thing that we have to recognize as we look at this encounter with Jesus is that you can be a moral, religious, active person in the church and completely miss it. You need to be born again. Which leads me to my second point. To be born again, is to repent and believe in Jesus. You know, the people in the book of Numbers who were bitten by the snake, all they had to do was to lift their eyes to the serpent and they were going to be saved. And for us, it's the same. All we have to do is to lift our eyes to Jesus and we're going to be okay. But in order to actually be a part of the kingdom of God, we have to do things Jesus's way. You know, a lot of church people, I've talked to a lot of church people in my life. I am a church person. I grew up a missionary kid, pastor's kid. Um, 
And the thing that I have to constantly check about myself and make sure that I'm, I'm have this inappropriate thing. I have to make sure that I am doing things God's way instead of the way I want to do things. And if Jesus says the only way to be born again, to enter into the kingdom of heaven is to repent and believe, we have to just take him seriously for this. Because here's what we love to do. We love to say, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll remember to believe, but I, uh, I, I'm doing pretty good. I, I'm, I'm just like a moral person. Like I myself am a good person. I, 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 I want to, I, and what you actually do a lot of people like this is you put a lot of trust and faith in your ability to keep the law, your ability to do good, your ability to add whatever you want to add to your relationship with Jesus. And whenever we do that, we become like this Pharisee. We become like Nicodemus who put all the onus on himself to follow the law instead to believe and repent. You know the way, you know how you repent? You know what repenting is? Repenting is just to agree with Jesus about your sin. To agree. Because here's what we love to do. We love to say things like, it's not a big deal. Listen, everybody does it. It's fine. Like, it's, it's really not a huge thing. I'm okay. You know, it's not the best, but it's not the worst. And I think I'm going to keep going this direction because I, I like it. I want to, whatever. Um, repentance, you know what that is? Repentance is looking at your sin and looking at, looking at it in light of the cross of Jesus. And you realize that sin is such a big deal to God. It's such a serious offense that literally the only way that God could think of to reconcile us back to him and fix the problem of sin was to kill a son. Every time you don't think sin is that big a deal and you don't think that you totally need to repent, um, recognize that it, it took Jesus Christ, the son of God, the, the pre-existing eternal one third of the Trinity to die for you. And so when Jesus asks us, hey, the way that you get in is just to, be, to agree with me about the reality of sin in your life, to turn from your sin, to repent is like to do a 180. I'm going this direction. I realize this is a bad direction. So I'm going to turn and go this direction and believe that Jesus is going to save you. That's what it means to repent and believe in Jesus. But in order to be born again, what's interesting is that Jesus had to suffer and die. Why, why is that the case? Why would he do this? It says so in this next verse. And this next verse is probably one of the more famous verses uh, you've heard of. Tim Tebow had this on his, on his like, uh, area right here. What do you call this? Eye black. I don't know. Um, like it, it's a big verse. And this is the reason why Jesus did all the stuff that we're talking about, why he suffered, why he died. It says this in John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. Why did Jesus die for you? Why did he offer, why is he able to offer you eternal life through his sacrifice is because he loved you. He loves you. And you may think that you've done so many things that just like so separate you from God. Do you know that God loves you so much more than you can even imagine? He loves you. The reason this verse is one of the more famous verses it's because it's like one of the best pieces of news that we've ever received. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And he goes on to say more about this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. You know, God did not send Jesus in here to look at you and your sin to be like, look how bad you are. He did not send Jesus to shove your nose in your sin. He didn't come here to condemn you. What did he come here to do? He did not, he did not uh, send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order for the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. And whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world 
And people, they love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And for everyone who does wicked things, they hate the light and does not, do not come to the light, lest the works be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. The reason that we have the ability to be born again is because Jesus died for our sins and he died for our sins because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you so much that he didn't come to condemn you. He had every right to condemn you. We've walked away from him. We've been an unfaithful bride to him. We have cheated on him time and time again. But God is so kind that he doesn't want to condemn you. He looks on you with compassion instead of condemnation. And the thing that he's reminding us in here is, as well is that our, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but that through him the world may be saved. You realize that everyone, the, the state of the human condition, is that we are condemned people. That we have intrinsic sin that we are born with because of Adam that have been passed down the line. So this is called this original sin. But we didn't have to have this original sin to be sinful. We do bad things all the time. There are mistakes that you and I make. We hurt people. We lash out at people. We do things that offend other people in God. And some people think that they can avoid the penalty of sin if they just opt to not be religious, opt to not think about Jesus. And so when you ask people like, hey, you know, um, what about God? They're like, no, I'm, I, don't, I don't subscribe to any of that. I don't want to deal with any of that. You realize even if you don't subscribe to that, you live that. And the reality is there is a day coming that, that is going to be the end of your life. Every single person in this room is going to die once and then there's judgment. And the thing that we have to understand is that if we die without being born again, we are going to be eternally separated from Jesus forever in a place called hell. We'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus did not, he saw the destination that we all deserve to be. And so he inserted himself in there. So Jesus, he doesn't want you to be condemned. That's why he came. That's why he came to wipe your debt clean, to make you clean. But you got to believe in Jesus. You got to repent from, from your sin and turn to him. You got to believe in him. You have to be born again. You got to be born again, which leads me to my last question. Are you born again? Have you had a moment or season in your life where you realize, man, I, I'm going the wrong way. And listen, you may think that you're fine because you grew up in church. Know that there are no grandfathered in Christians. You have to, you individually have to make the decision. Either you believe in Jesus or you don't. In this conversation with Nicodemus, he's pointing out the fact that you can do a whole lot. You can think that you're doing a lot, putting a lot of trust and faith in your own self and your ability to do things. But when push comes to shove, what you need to make sure in order to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, in order to have a home in heaven when you die, is if you can answer this question, are you born again? So I just have three short things in, in closing to help, help you determine if you are born again or not. The first thing that we learn from this encounter with Jesus is do you, do you respect Jesus or do you believe in Jesus? Do you respect Jesus or do you believe in Jesus? You know, Nicodemus, he, he respected Jesus. He said, sir, rabbi, I, I know you're a great teacher. And, um, it's not enough to be wowed by what Jesus does, maybe in your life or people around you's life. It's not enough to think that Jesus is a good moral teacher. It's not enough to think that Jesus has a couple good ideas that would help society at large. It's not enough to respect him. The question is, do you believe him? Do you believe that he's the son of God, the Messiah, the Christ who has come to make a way for us to be forgiven? You know, C.S. Lewis once said, there's a famous thing that he said, um, that there's really only three opinions you can have about Jesus. You either think that he is a liar because Jesus said a lot of 
preposterous things if you take out the divinity. Like he said he is God. He said that he's, he resurrected back to life again. Like he, he said a lot of interesting things about who he is. So either he knowingly is saying that, knowing that he is not those things, which makes him a liar. Number two, he's a lunatic where he's, no, he's saying those things, but he actually believes those things. And he's just like a crazy person who doesn't actually know what he's talking about. So he's either a liar or a lunatic. But the third thing that Jesus can be, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's right, or he's Lord. You have to come to a conclusion about who Jesus is. You can't just have a generic, I think he's probably a good religious moral person. Either you respect Jesus, you don't respect Jesus, or you believe that he is Lord. Do you believe in Jesus? The second thing is that have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Or are you relying on your ability to obey to get into heaven? There are really two ways that you can miss God. The first way is is to think that you are so bad that God would never forgive you. And this is what a lot of people do. You probably heard this before. When you invite people to church, young adults or something, and they say, oh, I would never be able to go there. The walls might cave in. The roof might cave in. Have you heard this this, comment before from people? These are people who think that they are too far gone for God to forgive them and love them and accept them. That's the first way that you can miss God. And by the way, Jesus is actually pretty powerful. There's nothing more powerful than Jesus' ability to forgive you. The second way that you can miss God is by thinking you're too good for him. By thinking that you don't need him. By thinking that you're a moral person on your own, that you are a good person on your own. So when people ask you, hey, do you think you're going to get to heaven when you die? You say, yeah. And they say, why? And you say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I can do a lot of good stuff. I help out people. I I do a lot of really great things. This story reverses that whole narrative because Nicodemus had all the religious and moral and spiritual standing that anyone could have. And yet Jesus looked at him and said, you're doing a lot, but you're missing the picture. You're missing the forest for the trees. But Jesus looked at this guy who everyone thought would be okay, that everyone thought would be good. And he says to him, no one gets in unless you're born again. And listen, some people look at this and say like, listen, okay, I just have to focus on this and I don't have to do anything good. I don't have to do anything nice or, or whatever. Um, there, there are things that I'm going to call the tools of discipleship, the tools that make you more like Jesus. There there are things like reading your Bible, praying, going to church, uh, sharing your faith with other people, um, obeying his commandments. These are really good, important tools of discipleship. These things make you more and more like Christ. This is the process of sanctification. These are good things, but if you turn the tools of discipleship into your pathway into salvation and the kingdom of God, you forfeit relying on God to save you and you start relying on yourself to save you. You see what I'm saying? If you put so much stock in your ability to do good things, you're missing it. You have to make sure you get the order right. If you just believe in Jesus and ask him to save you and you trust him And out of that relationship and love, then it spurs you on to do good things. That's beautiful. That thing will make you more and more like Jesus. But be careful, Christian in here, to never make those things how you get to God. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ or are you relying on your ability to get into heaven? And then lastly, um, are you letting God's light shine through you? Are you letting his light shine you just through you? He, uh, Jesus ends this conversation with this man talking about light and talking about darkness and talking about how um, people who do evil don't like the light of God in their lives because it exposes them. And there are two types of people, people who feel judged by God's light and people who feel comforted by God's light. And the question that you need to ask yourself is, are you someone who is comforted by the light of God in your life when it exposes you? Are you letting him shine through you? Are you like different because of what God is doing in your life? 
Or are you someone who shies away from anything that God would want to do through you because you don't want God to let in to what you have going on? These are three things that we need to understand. Do you respect Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ or are you relying on your own ability to get into heaven? And then are you letting God's light shine through you? Only you know, you and Jesus know if you've been born again. You got to remember, and we got to keep saying this over and over again because we so mess this up. It's not about doing a lot of right things. It's about trusting in Jesus. So have you trusted in Jesus? Have you asked him to, to forgive you? Do you know what happened to Nicodemus? You know, he, he ends this conversation. We don't really hear about any, anything that he's done until Jesus is crucified. And after Jesus is crucified, what happens is that Nicodemus, he shows up with this guy named Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret believer. And he asks for the body of Jesus. And this is interesting because once uh, Joseph of Arimathea, it said, was a secret follower of Jesus. And Nicodemus was someone who met with Jesus at nighttime because he didn't want to be associated with it. Um, and the heat of the stuff going on with Jesus, whenever he died, both these men, who were kind of cowardly, they got bold. And they asked and said, hey, can we have his body? We want to prepare it for burial and we want to bury it. And what's interesting is that Preparing the body for burial, putting all the perfume and all that stuff and wrapping it and all that thing, that was stuff that women in the, at that time and slaves did. And so what we've learned from Nicodemus right here is that he showed incredible boldness to be seen with this revolutionary's body, to associate himself with this body. And he also showed humility to prepare this body. And we don't know for sure, but it seems as if there is evidence to support that Nicodemus was someone who finally got it. I imagine when he, Nicodemus saw Jesus on the cross, he remembered this conversation about how just like the serpent had to be lifted up, so the Son of Man has to be lifted up. And I wonder if that just was like a light bulb moment where he's like, you are the Son of Man. You are God. And every single person in this room, we have to come to a conclusion like that. We have to figure out if we believe in him or we don't. And I so badly want for every single person in this room to experience the grace, the mercy, and the salvation that comes when you just give up going your way and you go God's way.